And he was absolutely right. That is what we should be doing. You know, it's not just uh, a matter of flying the plane by the book or by the ACS. These are sort of techniques that just take your flying to a whole new level. That's Dr. Catherine Cavagnaro talking about one of three dozen things she talks about in this show that will help you fly more professionally and increase the odds you'll pass your private and commercial check rides. Plus, she has lots of stories about things pilots have done on check rides. You just gotta love the stories. Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, a weekly show with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. Last week in episode 207, we talked with Rob Mark about an accident in which fighters chased a beechcraft with an unconscious pilot and about other recent hypoxia-related accidents. So if you missed that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 207. This week, I videotaped our conversation with Catherine. So if you'd like to see that video and the many other bonus videos I post for members, just sign up at the $20 a month or higher level at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, because this is a listener supported show and you are all awesome listeners. And think about it this way. How much would you pay for an hour of ground instruction? And would you learn 36 new things in that hour? So please consider supporting the show with whatever you'd pay for an hour of ground instruction at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And if the Aviation News Talk podcast is new to you, in whatever app you're using to listen to us, just click on the subscribe button so new episodes will download for free each week. You're going to love this episode with Catherine, and you won't want to miss future shows. Now let me tell you a little bit about Catherine Cavagnaro. She is an expert on spins, aerobatics, and upset recovery techniques. She learned from and taught with spin doctor and aviation author William K. Kirshner, who once performed 25 consecutive spins in a Cessna 152. Catherine went on to break his record by performing 60 continuous spins. Catherine is a doctor in her own right, as she holds not only an ATP and a CFI certificate, but also a PhD in mathematics. She is a professor of mathematics at the University of the South and has chaired the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science. Catherine was named by the FAA as the 2018 National FAA Safety Team Rep of the Year and as the 2020 National CFI of the Year. She has written for a number of magazines and is a popular presenter at AirVenture and AOPA Regional Fly-Ins. She also serves as a DPE giving check rides and owns a flight school called Ace Aerobatics that's located at Suwannee Franklin County Airport, that's KUOS, on the campus of the University of the South. Now here's our conversation with Catherine Cavagnaro. Catherine, welcome to the show. It's great to have you back. Max, thanks for having me back yet again. <laughs> well, I recently had someone comment that one of their favorite episodes was listening to you talk about spins, so of course we're having you back. I love that. And I'm glad that that uh, podcast was helpful. Super. Well, you wrote a couple of articles in the past few months, one in September, one in October in AOPA Pilot Magazine that talked about things that people do on commercial check rides that were a little less than professional. So I thought today we'd talk about flying like a pro. And I think it's the little things that count. You know, most of the things you talked about were nitsy little kinds of things that people might not have you know, heard about during flight training, but they make a huge difference. Let's kind of start with the beginning. Talk about getting a standard pre-flight briefing and things that people might overlook when they're doing that. Absolutely. So on um, practical exams, especially for the private and the commercial, we have to actually for the instrument as well, we need to ask for a cross country to be planned. And I'm sort of surprised and disappointed sometimes that candidates come without having secured a standard briefing for our uh, flight. And some even admit to me that they have never secured a standard briefing before. And if you've, especially if you've come for an instrument check ride or a, uh, a commercial check ride, it makes me wonder how have you been going on those cross countries? And, you know, there are a number of ways that you can secure a standard briefing. Uh, the FAA gave some guidance in an advisory circular in early 2021 that talks about how a self-briefing can actually satisfy the requirements of uh, a standard briefing. And, you know, it's more than just about weather. If you avail yourself of a 
a standard briefing, then you are obviously, you know, checking weather, both current and forecast, but you're also availing yourself of information like NOTAMs or TFRs and those sorts of things. So, you know, you can call 1-800-WX-BRIEF and speak with a briefer. I still do that because those people honestly know more about weather than I ever will. Uh, So on occasion, I'll still call a briefer. But uh, you can get one via your electronic flight bag, whether it's Garmin Pilot or ForeFlight or one of the others. You can certainly obtain one that way or on the web. So I don't care how people go about getting their briefing, but I want to see that they have a comprehensive set of information so that they can make an informed decision on if that flight is a go. And, and actually, this came up on a commercial check ride a few months ago. I had a student plan a, or candidate plan a, a flight to Asheville, North Carolina. And basically, it was a beautiful day. It was a, gonna, it was promised to be a gorgeous flight over the Smokies to uh, Asheville, North Carolina. And apparently, he had not gotten a, obtained a, a standard briefing. And, you know, I finally asked him, he said, okay, yeah, it's a go. It's a beautiful day to make this flight. And I said, well, how are your passengers going to react when you, when ATC tells you that the airport is closed? You know, are you going to refund them their money for, <laughs> for this flight? And, you know, that looks pretty bad to not realize that the airport is actually closed. So you can save yourself from that kind of embarrassment uh, by getting a standard briefing. (laughs) Now, I'm just kind of curious, how did you happen to know the airport was going to be closed and have him choose the flight plan to that destination? Is there some way to figure out which airports in your area are closed easily without checking every NOTAM? So it's interesting. I did not do that on purpose. Ah. What I found is that, uh, you know, I usually will assign cross countries to places that I would like to visit. In Asheville, North Carolina, I've been in there a number of times, and it's a beautiful area, a gorgeous airport. And this had been a few days before. I said, hey, why don't you plan a flight to Asheville, North Carolina? And uh, it, I received my own standard briefing before the practical exam started. So of course I saw the note in the section that said <laughs> airport closed. But you know, if you only check weather, you don't tend to notice that the fact that the airport is closed. So so I noticed it myself a little while before the practical exam started. So and you know that would have been fine for him to say, well, okay, the airport is closed. And we would have then continued on that cross-country plan as a thought exercise. Okay, the airport's closed, but let's go ahead and and look at the rest of the planning. Had the airport been open, would this still have been a go? So, you know, I don't try to throw curveballs, but here's the thing, you know, curveballs come in just our normal flying. I'm sure you've had your own curveballs thrown at you, and uh, I, I don't really have to try to trip people up. Things just happen. Right. It, it, it's so funny because you and I have talked at one point and kind of both said, yeah, stuff like this has happened to, to us. So for the folks who are listening, yeah, the reason we know to avoid these mistakes is because we've made these mistakes. Many years ago, I was flying to a South Lake Tahoe airport and got there. And guess what? The airport was closed. Now, it turned out that they were using the taxiway as the alternate runway while they were continuing to repair the the actual runway. But it was pretty embarrassing to realize, oh, man, I made a a fairly junior mistake in that uh, that regard. Well, you wrote a story about stepping on flaps, and I thought that came up in kind of an interesting way. Tell us about that. Right. Actually, so I've been flying for 20 years. 22 years now? Yeah. By the way, a number of these items of which you and I are going to speak today, now I've been guilty of a number of these as well. So, and this is just last year. So in my 21st year of flying, and I feel like I, you know, I've learned some things along the way, but I was swapping bonanzas with a friend of mine who lives in Michigan. And we met halfway and uh, we so that he could take my plane to Michigan for her annual. And then I was going to take his bonanza back to Tennessee. And I was putting my things into his plane and I stepped up on the wing and his flap has the, um, you know, the black anti-skid paint on the flap as well as the wing. And so I just stepped up there 
And I hear this. He just barked at me. He said, hey, get off my flap. And I was really confused because I said, well, the flap is retracted and, uh, you know, it's got the anti-skid on it. I thought, okay, well, it didn't say no step. So, I, you know, I asked him to explain and he said, well, listen, you know, that's a part that moves. And I prefer to just be gentler to my airplane. And, you know, why step on the flap if you don't have to? And I thought, you know, that's a great idea. That's, that makes a lot of sense. So I'm still continuing my education on a proper way to treat airplanes. And ever since then, I don't step on my own flap either, even though it has, of course, that anti-skid paint, which would lead you to believe that it's okay to. But I thought that was a really a good lesson. I like that. And it kind of goes along the general theory of we should treat mechanical objects well, because mechanical objects wear out over time. You don't want to to beat them up because eventually uh, you're going to have problems with them. They break, things like that. I had an incident that occurred, gee, in the past week in which I uh, got into an airplane with a gentleman I'd never flown with before. Uh, he had flown uh, mostly older Cirruses in the past. And a lot of those doors, yeah, you really need to give them a, a good slam to get them to close properly. Now, it turns out, starting in 2016, I believe, They've got doors where you can pull them in, you know, with your pinky, hardly any force required at all to close them. And then you just push the handle down. And as he reached for the door, I put up my hand and I said, stop. And unfortunately he just, boy, I, I mean, he slammed that door so hard. My ear hurt afterwards, the, the, the left ear on that side of the airplane. So I would say to folks in general, doors on airplanes are not as heavy as doors on cars. And usually they're very lightweight by comparison. Yet a lot of people, passengers in particular, will slam doors because they're used to slamming car doors. So word to the wise, you know, eventually those doors are going to wear out. Right. And I actually learned a similar lesson on making sure I brief people on closing the door before they even get in the airplane. I was flying a Turbo Saratoga that was a friend of mine. And I was flying with my sister. And so the owner of the plane is in the back. I'm flying. And my sister, who's not a pilot, was getting in on the right side. And I hadn't breathed her on the door. And before I could say anything, she takes the door and she just slams it. And I just cringe. You know, it, this is not my airplane. And, and even whether it's my airplane or not, I just, oh, I, I just cringed. And I knew he was dying in the back and he didn't want to be rude to my sister. But I learned my lesson there that you brief people on how to close the door before they're anywhere near the door. Yep, exactly. All kinds of little gotchas here in flying. Well, let's talk about one that uh, you know both you and I have encountered, and that's the brake check. Talk about uh, some of your brake check stories and then I'll throw in some of mine if I have others. Okay, so I give a number of practical exams as a designated examiner. And I'll tell you, this is really independent of the type of exam, whether it's private instrument or even commercial. The candidate will typically do a brake check after startup. And, you know, first of all, we they give some throttle, we get moving, and then they slam on the brake so hard that it doubles as an integrity check for our safety harnesses. And it shouldn't do that, right? So, you know, we're thrust against the safety harnesses, which is really uncomfortable. And also some people will hit the brakes before retarding the throttle, which to me does, just doesn't make sense. And it's uncomfortable. And what's even more, and this ties into the exchange of flight controls, they'll often ask me, would you like to test your brakes? To which I'll say usually, Yes, please. And and so they just suddenly will say, your airplane, and they take their hands and feet off the controls, and the throttle isn't at idle. So here we are about to careen into a line of parked aircraft, and I'm racing to get my feet on the brakes. And that's another thing. Before you exchange flight controls, that three-way exchange is there for a reason. For instance, if I am handing the controls back to somebody, I keep my hands on the controls until they verbally tell me they have the controls and I visually see they have the controls. 
And only then do I take my hands and feet off the controls. So I've seen some just really less than graceful and sometimes downright potentially dangerous, you know, break checks. What have you seen, Max? Well, I think that uh, you, you make a really good point. And let me just talk, I'm going to talk about those things in reverse order. The three-way positive exchange of the controls. I don't think, certainly I don't give enough explanation there in terms of, you know, don't release the controls until you've heard me say it. You know, I talk about what the three three exchanges of words we're supposed to use, but I'm probably not explicitly saying, and don't release until you hear the second part, which is me saying that I have the control. So you raise, I think, a really excellent point. Getting back to the rapid brake checks, to me, failing to pull the throttle before applying the brakes is kind of like having both feet down on the pedals in your car. When you're braking, do you keep your foot on the accelerator when you brake? No, absolutely not. And then you have to think about the the lifetime of the brakes. Brakes eventually wear out. Do you really want to be using maximum force and having the throttle keeping the airplane moving when you jump on those brakes? You, know, you might actually need those brakes sometime in a more serious situation like coming down the runway. So why just jam on them to the point where you're putting excessive wear on them when you start? Now, uh, I told you uh, before we started here that when I did my commercial check ride, the very first thing the examiner said as I started out was, hey, you're riding the brakes. And it, it was not something that any of my flight instructors had ever called me on before. So I had developed a habit. And certainly I tell folks that they need to basically keep their heels on the floor when they're taxing. If you've got your feet just lightly resting on the pedals as you might in the car, you almost certainly are applying a little bit of brake and you might not be aware of it. Right, exactly. Well, let's talk about, uh, this is certainly a pet peeve of mine. I don't know if you see this. Uh, what about people who are taxing and doing other things while they're taxing? Yeah, that's a bad idea. And I think you know, we might be lulled into that habit because, you know, most of the time, maybe you can get away with it. But uh, I know of a flight instructor and a student who actually taxied right into another aircraft across the way because both of them were heads down and not looking at what they were doing. And they taxied right into uh, another airplane. I had a commercial exam that didn't end so well for precisely that reason. We exited the runway and he was heads down taking care of some after landing items while we were taxiing on the taxiway. And we we started to veer off the taxiway. So I had to take the controls to make sure that we didn't hit a taxiway light. And that's not that's not a successful end to a commercial check ride that otherwise had been satisfactory. So uh, obviously that that's a big deal, whether it's a check ride or it's flying with uh, friends, family, or you know other passengers. That that's a big deal. Yes, I tell people that when they're taxing, if there's something they have to do, just stop the airplane. It might be as simple as putting in a transponder code, but do you really want to be looking down and twisting knobs when the airplane is in motion? You might not see where it's headed. The other thing at, at our club, we insist that when people do their after landing checklist, that they get off the runway before they start touching things on the runway. They're not raising flaps while they're still rolling out on the taxiway. And they come to a full stop when they run through their after landing checklist. Right. Yeah. That's, that's what's going to keep all these airplanes flying longer. <laughs> Indeed. Well, tell us about flight controls free and correct. I think you have a story about that. Oh, yeah. My bruised knees attest to the fact that when candidates do their flight controls free and correct, they do that without warning me. And, you know, if I could have just a couple of seconds to get my knees out of the way, then I wouldn't have the bruises that I do have uh, on my knees. So just look at your passenger and, and say, you know, excuse me, I'm about to test the flight controls or you might want to move your iPad or, you know, just give them, give us a heads up so we can move our devices and body parts so we're not bruised in, in the process. Well, and I could say that a bruised knees is minor. Let me say that uh, for people who are flying something like a Diamond DA40, which has a stick between your legs, 
please <laughs> warn the flight instructor before you start doing that free and <laughs> free and correct check on the on the stick. I will I will leave it at that. <laughs> I can try to imagine, but yes, I think that, that's, a, that's a good point, Max. <laughs> Moving right along, let's talk about the Magneto check again. I think you've got a story about that. Yeah, so I, I always have to wonder what the rush is. So, you know, we have a Magneto switch that has, you know, off, left, right, and both. And, you know, it's just funny to me why people can't just slowly turn to make sure that they're hitting each detent. So usually when I do my mag check, I do two clicks to the left, you know, count one, two, then back to both, one click to the left, back to both. And in about that time, but what'll happen sometimes is that they try to change it so quickly that they'll go all the way to off. And then you get this painful backfire, which means, which could potentially mean an expensive trip to the uh, mechanic later. And it, of course, if you ever go to that off position, just hands off, let the airplane stop, because it's in coming back to both that you might get that backfire. Or they come back to both so fast that they over pass both to start and then you just get this painful sound so i just don't understand uh how why there's always a race for the the mag check but i see that with virtually everyone with whom i fly i don't do you see the same thing well i want to put it under a more general category which is when you get to the airport slow down uh, I got to tell you, as a, a younger man, I used to race around in life and I would do the same thing when I got to the airport and invariably it was counterproductive. I have never saved time at the airport by hurrying and I have caused lots of problems by hurrying. Some of those have been you know, scrapes on my head, bangs on my thighs, tears in my clothing. I remember tripping over a chain one time. Uh, it just doesn't pay to move fast when you're in an airplane. Do everything kind of slowly and deliberately, even if your modus operandi is that in the rest of your life you're racing around like a NASCAR driver. And that's fine. But yeah, think of the airport as a, as a different environment. What I've seen on the mag check, and I like how you said two clicks to the left first, is I sometimes see students who will do one click to the left first. And on two cases, I have seen where when they went to return it to the both position, they didn't get all the way back to both. Now that's not going to happen if you do two clicks to the left first and then one click. In the first case, we actually took off on one mag. After having seen that, the second time I saw this happen, I told them, hey, you can't take off. You're not in the both position. So it really is helpful to to do two clicks to the left first and then one click to the left because <laughs> you're not going to undershoot when you come back to the both position. Exactly. And I think the difference between what I see and what I'm advocating is probably a total of three seconds, right? So we're not talking about, you know, running the Hobbs meter crazy. I'm just talking, just be a little bit slower there. And by the way, my, probably my favorite expression is, and I remind myself of this all the time, in order to get someplace more quickly, go more slowly. And I can't tell you how many times that has reaped benefits in my own life, just to remind myself to just slow down uh, because I'm not going to make those uh, mistakes as, as frequently like you say. And then I have to go back and redo things. So uh, anyway, I, I like that expression. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think you're more likely to catch mistakes or more likely to create mistakes if you're going more slowly and deliberately. So yes, I think that all falls under the category of flying like a pro. Let's talk about uh, adding throttle on takeoff. <laughs> right. Any stories there? And again, what I'm advocating is taking two more seconds to go from, say, idle throttle at the start of the runway to the full position. And sometimes what I see is just yamming the throttle in and that's uncomfortable for passengers. Passengers don't want to hear such abrupt engine changes. And, and sometimes it's to the point where I hear a, a bit of a cough or a sputter. 
that can't be efficient <laughs> for takeoff, right? So uh, yeah, just, you know, you'll gain the confidence of your passengers just by going a little more slowly, a little more smoothly. And I guarantee you, your takeoff performance is not going to suffer. In fact, it probably will improve. You had a story about what somebody did to the throttle in Wilbur while you were doing a spin training one time. <laughs> Tell us about that. Yeah, so this is an article that I did just recently. And, uh, you know, this was on uh, scenario-based training. So the idea behind it is with my mentor, we used to play the what if game. You know, what if you, what if this happened to you in an airplane? What would you do? And that kind of scenario based training is fabulous for the days where, you know, those sorts of things do happen and surprise us. So I had a spin student and I had clearly underestimated how nervous he was about spinning. You know, I talked him through the recovery. And what he ended up doing, the first ingredient in the recovery in my airplane is to close the throttle. And then later on, you're going to be pushing forward on the yoke. So he hadn't completely closed the throttle. And he, when he was pushing forward on the yoke, he took my throttle and he bent it downward so that it broke. Anyway, so I didn't have the ability after that to change my throttle setting. Anyway, that, that time that I had spent with my mentor musing about these sorts of incidents, and actually this was one of the ones that he had presented to me years ago. What would you do if you couldn't change your throttle setting? And so I maneuvered, we had partial throttle, maneuvered back over the airport and at a, an appropriate point, cut the mixture, brought it in for basically a dead stick landing. So it all worked out pretty well, but yeah, that it seemed unlikely at the time. I was like, okay, when could that possibly happen? Well, I found out exactly how it could possibly happen when you have a student who is is really nervous. These things do happen. I know a local flight instructor who was flying someone into Cirrus, and the pilot pushed so hard on the handle, the handle broke. And so they were left with an aircraft that was at full power. And of course, their only choices remaining at that point are usually the mixture or the uh, the, the magneto key. So yes, these things happen more commonly than, than people might think. And let's see one other thing about uh, throttles. I know that there was a recent change in the SR-20 G6 POH, which is aircraft built since uh, 2017. And that now explicitly says that you should take two to three seconds when applying the throttle. And we had noticed in that particular model that there were times when the engine would stumble very badly on takeoff if somebody you know, advanced the throttle quickly. So that was actually a, a change. So yeah, good, good counsel for everybody. Go slowly on that throttle. Let's see, you talked about clearing the area before maneuvers, and I had never heard the uh, legal concept applied to this of the statute of limitations on cleared <laughs> turns. So clearly, clearly you have a legal background here as well. Tell us about that. So what I have to say, it's one of my pet peeves on a practical exam. First of all, sometimes uh, candidates will ask me, how would you like me to clear the area? And I tell them, I, have, I couldn't care less. I just want to make sure that we're not going to hit any other airplane. We're not going to hit any terrain or obstacles. So there are many ways to clear an area and they're all fine as long as they guarantee that uh, we are going to continue our flight safely. But then I've noticed in some of these checklists that folks will clear the area, you know, clearing the area is an item in the checklist. And, you know, they, they maybe do it in two subsequent 90 degree turns, you know, maybe left and back to the right, which is fine. But then, you know, clearing the area is actually a maneuver as well. So sometimes I'll see them start their clearing turn without looking first. And that's just crazy because there could be an airplane right to our left. And in clearing the area, you might be turning right into them. So it's always good to lift the wing, say, if you're in a high wing or, or look behind you, look you know, to the uh, side and behind you before you make any turns like that. So that's number one, is make sure that you clear the area even during your, right before and during your clearing turns. And then some of these checklists have clearing the area followed by a number of different items that 
might take another two or three minutes to complete. And of course, you know, the candidate might be kind of nervous as well, right? So they might be kind of getting their guts up to, to make that steep turn or do the chandelle or whatever the case may be. And, you know, two or three or four minutes might have elapsed between when we do the clearing turn and when we start the maneuver. And, and there again, I see that they start the maneuver without looking to make sure that they're not going to turn into anybody. So I, I point out that, uh, in my opinion, there's a statute of limitations on a cleared area. You might have looked uh, to see that the area is clear, but that doesn't mean that it's clear two or three or four minutes later. So just on a practical level, anytime you turn the airplane, always look in that direction and behind and make sure that you're not going to be turning into anybody. So I just take a very practical approach uh, in terms of clearing the area. Another great tip for flying like a, a pro. And one of the things that I tell folks, and this kind of goes to the whole concept of what are the little things that we do to, to fly more professionally, is that when they're taxiing and when they're flying, they want to do it imagining that they've got a hundred people sitting in the back and that some of them are drinking coffee as well. And I see folks who jerk aircraft around, you know, they go rapidly into turns and, you know, they, they just honk on the rudder because, oh, you know, let's just step on it violently. It's like, no, 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 people. You, you, what you really want to have is nice, quiet hands. And I think one of the nicest compliments uh, another flight instructor ever made to me uh, years ago, he was actually a, a local dealer for the Diamond uh, DA-40. He took me for my very first ride in a diamond almost 20 years ago. And he said, Max, you have quiet hands. And I thought, wow, that's, that's a nice compliment. And that's really, I think what we're all strive for is to be nice and smooth and gentle on the controls all the time. Yeah. It's actually uh, interesting. You bring that up too, because uh, you know, my, as a flight instructor, I virtually exclusively teach aerobatics. And I think some folks come for aerobatics with the preconceived notion that, okay, now we're going to rack this plane around and, and you know, sort of show it to its boss. And what my mentor taught me years ago is that good aerobatics is smooth aerobatics. Good aerobatics is as gentle to the airplane as possible. There's, you can be authoritative, but smooth. Authoritative does not mean jerky. And so I was, I learned a lot from him. And that's one thing that I try to impart to all of my students and candidates is that, you know, you're going to inspire confidence by being gentle to the airplane. Uh, and again, you can be authoritative, but smooth. And that's, for example, what some of those commercial maneuvers should be. A, a Shondell should be authoritative, but very smooth. Your passengers should have absolute confidence in you as a pilot. Let's come back and talk about the landings now. You had a great story about a topic that I hadn't really quite thought about in, in that level of detail, which had to do with reducing manifold pressure before advancing the prop control. Made total sense. Tell us about that. Okay, well, I'll start with my own commercial training. So I flew, uh, I believe it was an arrow when I was working on my commercial. And, you know, all I had flown before that were non-complex aircraft. So this was my first experience with handling uh, retractable gear and a variable pitch propeller. And I had studied up on the, the POH. I made sure I had all of the procedures down. I was going to impress my <laughs> flight instructor. And so on the downwind, you know, I put the gear down and then I went ahead and advanced the propeller uh, lever forward uh, as it said in the POH. And of course, you know, we feel, we hear this change in, in pitch. It's, and then, you know, it's, it's a big speed break, right? Because you flatten the pitch and you get this attendant drag. And so, you know, we're, we're sort of pushed forward because of this change in pitch. And he just barked at me. He says, your passengers don't want to hear that and they don't want to feel it. And I was a little surprised. I didn't know what else to do. And he said, listen, wait until you've reduced the manifold pressure to below the propeller governing range. And then when you advance the propeller level forward, your passengers won't hear anything and they won't feel anything. 
And he was absolutely right. That is what we should be doing. You know, it's not just uh, a matter of flying the plane by the book or by the ACS. These are sort of techniques that just take your flying to a whole new level. And I really appreciated my uh, flight instructor, Frank Passarello uh, at the Tullahoma Airport, who shared that with me. And I have never forgotten that. And every time I fly an airplane that has a variable pitch prop, I always make sure that I know what the governing range is. So for my Bonanza, it is when I bring the prop level forward under 13 inches of manifold pressure, you won't hear or feel a thing. So I'm, I'm really grateful for him for helping me bring my flying to the next level. Well, that's a fabulous tip, and I was really happy to learn that from you. One of the things that's related to that that I've noticed over the years is that a small amount of movement on the prop control causes much greater impact on noise than the same amount on the throttle. And I think people get used to being able to move the throttle at a certain rate. you got to move the prop control much more slowly. That's absolutely true. Yeah, and one thing I like about my Bonanza is both the throttle and the propeller actually have vernier controls so that you can give just slight twists with some some really small changes. So I try to make most of my throttle inputs and certainly all of my propeller inputs using that. Yeah, the, the vernier controls really help a lot. Well, let's talk about crosswind landing techniques. I think you wrote about some stories that you've encountered with those as well. Right. So, you know, on practical exams, of course, crosswind landing techniques is an item in the ACS. And usually there has to be just on any given day, there's some bit of a crosswind. Typically, it's a rare day when the wind is exactly down the runway. And especially when I look out the window and I see a pretty whooping crosswind, I might say something like, so you know, when we get out on the runway, you know, the winds are coming from the east and, you know, you might be taking off on 1-8. How are you going to handle that crosswind? Oh, okay. Ailerons are going to start out fully to the left and then I'm going to ease them out as as uh, we take off. And then when we get out to the runway, we take off with ailerons uh, in the neutral position. And it's not, it's no shock that we get off the uh, runway and here we are, you know, veering toward the windsock. And a couple of times I've actually had to take over because of such poor directional control. And that's something, you know, I think crosswind takeoff and landing uh, techniques, that's, or proficiency, that's something that can atrophy for every one of us. So it's really important that we all go out regularly and, uh, and practice that. So I see big gaps in those techniques. And I think crosswind landings is one of those things that actually helps uh, with visualization. You know, if you've got time sitting at home in your easy chair, close your eyes, imagine that you're on final and, oh, I'm getting blown a little bit to the left of the final and just kind of visualize the control inputs you're going to use to get back on the final then think about as you're starting to flare, how you might be transitioning. And I think that really helps. Uh, visualization can be a very powerful technique for improving skills. And it's cheaper. The, the Hobbs meter is not running when you're doing that. Exactly. And, you know, this is a case where I see uh, in a number of instances, the plane is flying the pilot instead of the pilot commanding the plane. So the, the pilot's just along for the ride. And that's not going to cut it. Another thing that you and I both commented on in the past separately is airspeed on final. I find that particularly when I'm teaching the Cirrus, a lot of people have been taught to fly those airplanes fast. I think there's a misconception that, oh, you don't want to get slow, so you might stall. So therefore the answer is fly fast. It's like, no, that's not the answer. The answer is to fly the approach speed that you're supposed to fly. Right. I was grateful to my primary instructor who, uh, you know, I was I learned in a Cessna 150 and our approach speed was 60 knots. And that's the same approach speed that I use in my 152. And, you know, he would bark at me, you know, Catherine, 62 is not 60. 59 is not 60. So he, he was absolutely militant that I come in exactly at my approach speed. And that has served me incredibly well in my flying career because I fly out of an airport that is the only public use airport in Tennessee that's only 50 feet wide. 
It's short. It's got tall trees on all sides. We have some crazy winds and people get nervous coming in and, uh, you know, they might add five knots for the gusts and, oh, shoot, well, 10 knots sounds even safer. <laughs> and then they end up going off the end of the runway or getting into a PIO. Regardless, if you come in with even small changes in airspeed, that can significantly affect your landing distance. So you can think of landing distance as the square of that velocity. So if you're adding 10% to your approach speed, you're you're probably adding 21% to your landing distance. And from what I see, you know, with a 60 knot approach speed, adding say six knots would be 10%. Well, I see people add way more than that. So they are uh, really paying the price in terms of landing distance, wear on the brakes, maybe they slam on the brakes and they flat spot the tires. I mean, not, these are all things that make people not want to fly with you again, right? So, and we all, we all want folks to fly with us again. So nailing your approach speed is going to help you with all of those problems. And one thing I point out too is, you know, my uh, landing at my airport can be a bit of a challenge because like I say, it's, it's often kind of gusty and such. And if you come in with excessive airspeed, then what that means is you are battling those gusty conditions over the runway for longer. So if you come in with less energy, you're going to be down on the ground, landed, and you have less time to to be competing with all of those, uh, you know, wind swirls. So uh, I can't emphasize enough. Coming at the appropriate airspeed is uh, it works wonders for improving your landings. Yes, and there's some other disadvantages to to being fast in the pattern. For example, if you're fast on your base leg, well, then your uh, curvature, the uh, turn radius is going to get huge and you're more likely to overshoot the final, which is going to potentially cause a stall spin accident as a lot of airplanes will uh, overshoot and then try and fix it at that point instead of just going around. And getting to the proper speed when you're in the pattern and especially on final is so easy. You know, I tell folks, just watch the speed. If you, if you get one knot slow, push ever so slightly on the stick. If you get one knot fast, pull ever so slightly on the stick. Boy, if you do that, you can really nail the airspeed. Absolutely, yeah. If you concentrate on it, it's not hard to do at all. Definitely not. Now, you talked about folks uh, after they got on the ground kind of locking up the brakes. And I don't know, is that they're trying to, to get to the first taxiway? Or what, what are you seeing with people braking excessively after they land? Yeah, I can always tell the difference between an owner and a renter, right? A renter will slam on the brakes to make the first taxiway or to avoid going off the end. And an owner will, no, 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 baby the brakes, you know, just let, you know, rely on aerodynamic braking, you know, you can uh, pull, continue to pull back on the yoke and present a draggier profile uh, to help you slow down. But there's only one exception to that. And that was a friend of mine who would, he owned the plane and he slammed on the brakes to make the first uh, taxiway. And he told me that his pride was worth more than brake pads. And I can tell you, my pride is not worth more than brake pads. So, you know, I just feel like if everyone could own an aircraft, maybe they'd understand that these things are, are costly. But I think we can all understand the price that we pay by having aircraft that are not in the kind of condition that we all want to fly, right? So I always say that I want to fly an airplane like I hope the last person did. You know, if we all fly, if we all take care of these airplanes, then we will all be flying safer airplanes. And, you know, even if you're a renter, you'll be paying lower rental prices as well, because obviously with this increased maintenance, we all pay a higher price. Yeah. And I think it's worth pointing out that there are no gold medals for making the first taxiway. I mean, that's just silly. Uh, you're, you're keeping score on something that's really counterproductive. And I think controllers at towered airports sometimes contribute to the problem. At our airport, occasionally we'll hear them, and it's a high, very high-volume airport, so they're constantly, you know, four or five people you know, in the pattern. And they might tell somebody, you know, make a taxiway Charlie if able. I had a client who was flying a Cirrus, a good pilot, 
and yet he listened to that controller and he pushed hard on the brakes, blew a tire, and now the airport was closed for about an hour. All because the controller said, hey, try and make that taxiway. And being, uh, you know, someone who tries to be helpful, it's like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll try and help them. And, you know, they made, collectively, the two of them made things worse. So I always tell people, the way to select which taxiway you're going to get off is not to look ahead and go, oh, let's see if I can make that one. The way to select the taxiway is to brake normally. And now when you're back at a slow taxi speed, then decide which taxiway are you going to get off at? Right. And, you know, part of our professional duty is to, to know when to use the word unable. So make next taxiway if able. Maybe I'll take the next one if I need to. So, uh, yeah, I think we all need to be able to properly assess what we're able to do. And if we're not able to make that taxiway, then there's the next one. Well, we're taxiing the aircraft back to the tie down and let's talk about propeller blast. I know you and I both have stories on propeller blast. Well, this is just cringy, but, uh, you know, so for example, uh, we came back on a practical exam. And by the way, I've had this happen a number of times, but we're at the end of a row of aircraft at the left. Uh, that's the parking spot. And it would be easy to turn the plane all around, basically make a 270 to be able to back into the spot. But again, but instead, you know, the candidate makes a, a hard 90 degree turn to the right. Uh, and of course has a good bit of throttle in there and then just blasts that whole line of aircraft. And it's just so unnecessary. There are times when you do have to turn your tail to other aircraft but you should always do that with the absolute minimum amount of power that it takes to maneuver your tail in the correct position. And, you know, even if that's difficult to do, there are tow bars, right? We can shut down and we could guide the plane back with a tow bar. Uh, so just, just that little bit of planning ahead. And just thinking about how to care for not only the airplane you're in, but the other aircraft around you. You know, we're all grateful for that. But I don't think pilots realize they are fully responsible for their prop blast. So if you damage something, guess what? You are liable. You know, you could be sued for that. And you probably they will probably recover because that's pretty clear as to uh, who's responsible. At my airport, we have a fence that separates several aircraft that are parked from where people can park their cars. And whenever I pull out a 182, which is in one of those positions, uh, we don't just start up there next to the fence. We roll that airplane probably 30 feet forward, at least to minimize the blast through the fence to the cars, which are literally you know, four or five feet away from the tail of that aircraft. Now, let me ask you this, guess where I don't park my car when I go to the airport? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, some of these airports, I confess, when I go give practical exams, you know, whenever possible, I might fly myself to these airports. I don't park anywhere near <laughs> one of these where the flight school has their airplanes because I've seen too many times where they're just blasting these other aircraft and I just don't want mine to be one of them. So I typically try to find a space that's on the opposite side of the airport. Speaking of professional topics and flying an aircraft, one of the things I've noticed is descent planning or lack of it. I think that if people are in lower powered airplanes and they're you know, somewhat early in their flying career, descent planning is when I see the airport, I'm going to chop the throttle to zero. <laughs> well, talk a little bit about descent planning, especially in airplanes. Like for example, your Bonanza, you've got to, you've got to plan ahead. How do you do that? Absolutely. You know, it's really not that hard. So what I usually plan for is somewhere around a 500 foot descent. So, you know, I think about, well, how many minutes, uh, ballpark, how many minutes away do what will I need to be so that when I am at my 500 foot descent rate that, you know, when should I begin my descent? So I always have that in my head. So for instance, it might be say 20 miles from the airport and usually about 22 is when miles from the airport, maybe I'm 
contacting ATC and requesting my dissent, or at least letting know that I'm planning on on descending. Um, but yeah, you, we should always be thinking ahead about how we want our descent profile. Of course, sometimes there might be terrain involved, which means I, I might have a couple of descent segments. Uh, I don't want to get below such and such altitude, this distance from the airport. But we should always be thinking of those things in cruise, right? Because cruise flight gives us a nice opportunity to make those planned descents. But yeah, coming down at 1,500 feet a minute in a bonanza is not going to inspire my uh, family and friends to want to fly with me anymore. Well, it's also probably not particularly good for the engine. If you look at the lower powered airplanes, they've got a lot of metal per horsepower. They can really handle going from full power to zero when you spot the airport at the last moment. You take a 300 horsepower engine, for example, you don't really want to go from full power to zero because th that metal is going to be contracting as it, as it cools rather rapidly uh, in your last minute descent when you spot the airport. Right, exactly. So, you know, I usually have a, uh, I might bring the manifold pressure back just a little bit and set up, plan to descend at about the same airspeed that I was using in cruise. And again, that's just one of those little things where the, the passenger may not even notice that we've begun our descent. So every, every change in condition like that in flight, we want to make as seamless as possible and as undetectable as possible. Yeah, some of the turbocharged aircraft that I fly will run around 30 inches of manifold pressure in flight. And yet by the time we get to the pattern, I'd like to be down to maybe around 20 inches of manifold pressure to gradually cool the engine. And if I follow the guideline that most people use, which is reduce power one inch per minute or two inches every two minutes, that tells you you're going to need to start pulling power 10 minutes ahead of time to get from 30 inches of manifold pressure down to 20 inches. And if you're cruising along at maybe three miles a minute, hey, guess what? That's, that's going to be some distance from the, uh, from the airport. You need to start pulling the power back. Yep. Your engine is going to thank you <laughs> yeah. with, with longer years and hours of service. Well, I think that's the best way to reduce the cost of flying is to treat your engine well because it's not going to have to be replaced as soon as it would be. You know, another thing I see is the long straight in final. It's interesting to me that all of the training we give uh, students is in pattern work. And yet I don't remember reading anywhere in the FAA handbooks or anything that says, when you're flying the long straight in, here are techniques for flying the long straight in. And I think that people just assume, well, it's a no brainer. You just kind of aim for the, uh, the airport and descend and, you know, it works out fine. And yet what I've seen invariably, especially in you know, some faster aircraft, people end up high and fast and they don't know how they got there. And so what I generally tell them is you're going to lose about 300 feet per nautical mile. So your goal is really to cross a point about three miles from the airport at about a thousand feet above the airport. And you need to have slowed down to flap speed at that particular point in time. Because if you haven't, well, now when you take additional time to slow, you're going to get even closer to the airport. Then when you hit the flaps at the maximum flap speed, you're going to have bump up another one or 200 feet. And so, yeah, now you're going to be high and fast. So I think the, the long straight in just doesn't get much attention in flying. Right, exactly. So, you know, we have key positions in a regular rectangular pattern. We should also have key positions in a, a straight in, which is basically what an instrument approach does. So, you know, even if you're going to uh, an airport in VFR, it's not a terrible idea to dial in an instrument approach if, if there is one to the runway, uh, or at least use that kind of planning as a guidance. For those key positions. Yeah. And I think another way to look at it would be if you took a standard pattern and said each leg is a mile, for example, you know, from the time you pass the numbers on downwind, yeah, you've got roughly three miles to go. Just straighten that out. And on each of those one mile segments, be configured as you were in the first mile for downwind, the second mile for base and the third mile for final. And things are going to work out much better. Well, I'm trying to think other kinds of things that I think about in terms of professional flying. You know, one thing I would say is that people that are flying more professionally just have better situational awareness of what's going on. I think that there are a lot of folks who are listening to the radio and all they're doing is listening for their call sign when what they really should be doing is listening to what all the other airplanes around them are doing and then kind of project forward in their mind 
you know, if this airplane is on the 45 and I'm on the crosswind, oh, wait a minute, this might be a potential conflict. Why wait to discover that until you actually see that airplane up close and in person? Right. Painting that picture in your mind of what's going on at the airport is really an important thing to do, which necessitates, by the way, if you're hearing uh, announcements on the uh, radio, go ahead and be quiet. So I've heard people talk over other folks making announcements on, on the radio that are helping me get a picture of what's going on at the airport. You know, we've got somebody on a base, we've got somebody on a departure leg, we've got someone on the 45. And how are we going to enter this? Because sometimes this might be an instrument practical exam where I'm trying to weave all of this together to help the candidate get as close to the missed approach point as possible or complete as much of the approach as possible while being respectful of the other folks in the pattern. So if you hear other people making transmissions, just go ahead and be quiet for a sec and let's get let's let's together get a mental picture of what's going on there. Yeah, I think another thing that I see with folks that fly more professionally is they know more about the things in their airplane. So for example, especially as you move into glass cockpits, there's just a huge number of options and tools available to use. In fact, just to go back to what we were talking about, descent planning. You you and I just talked about how you can calculate uh, mentally uh, when to do descent planning. And yet in any of the modern GPSs or any of the modern glass cockpits, you've got tools in there that you can use to set up that will allow you to cross a thousand feet above the the terrain three miles away from the airport. Uh, So I think the professionals really do a better job of being curious and learning everything they can learn about their uh, their airplane, as, as I like to tell people, when you're when you're engaging in an activity that can kill you, it really pays to know everything you can know about that activity. Right. It's not cheating to use those tools. It's smart piloting. And you know, sometimes it, uh, I'll see, say, on an instrument practical exam where maybe I've let them know the approaches ahead of time that that we're going to uh, I'm going to have the person execute. I tell them later when they're setting up in the air, I tell them it's not cheating to have loaded that on the ground. If you expect that that's the first approach you're going to do, that's in fact, it's not cheating. It's just smart, right? Yeah, certainly when I got my instrument rating prior to the days of GPS, it was important to set up everything on the ground beforehand. You need to set those radials in. And likewise, why wouldn't you uh, set everything up immediately? I think the challenge we have as pilots is the heaviest workload occurs at the very end of the flight where we where we're also the most fatigued. And so it pays to take as many of those activities as you can and move them from the end of the flight back to earlier points in the flight. And that's just a really great approach to flying. Right. I think so much of what we've talked about so far today is just anticipation. Right. So when you're talking about setting up your airplane, I got my instrument rating in the days before, uh, you know, certainly I had uh, GPS uh, accessible in my own airplane. And, you know, every nav frequency, every comm frequency, the standby was set up to what I anticipated I would need. And, you know, most of the time that's what I needed. And rarely I would go change that. But again, most of the time it was just a matter of flipping the switch to the frequency that was already in there. And as soon as I did that and had a a moment, I would think, what was the next, what's the next frequency that I anticipate needing in that? And and I would go ahead and put it in the standby. Just anticipating is, um, you know, such an important thing for us to remember as pilots, because the smoother our workload is, again, the better experience our passengers are going to have. Yeah, working ahead makes total sense. The last area I can think of that we haven't touched about that I think really differentiates pilots from the pro pilots is communication. I see a couple key things. One, people who fly more professionally are less verbose. They are more precise. They're not throwing out excess words. When they call, they're not throwing in words like checking in. Well, of course we know that you are, you know, yeah. what else, what else yeah. would you be doing? 
with you. Yeah, again, yeah, you're, you're with me. And you know, so is, so is the supervisor with me on the other side of the radar screen. We all, we all know this, so you don't need to, uh, to say that, but perhaps an even bigger area is I think the more professional pilots seek to eliminate ambiguity and they seek clarification. And that could be if a controller gives a, a confusing uh, instruction, for example, years ago, I was cleared into the class B, but not with the words cleared into the class B or cleared into the class Bravo, the controller weasel worded it. And so I wanted it to be on tape, but I said, am I cleared into the class B? And he said, uh, oh, well, yeah, you're right. Yes, you're cleared into the class Bravo. <laughs> and so you don't want right. ambiguity. I also see this in the traffic pattern sometimes. I think uh, more experienced pilots, if someone calls in with an ambiguous position or if they say they're uh, on right downwind when standard is left traffic at the airport, hey, it pays to speak up and go, do you mean left traffic? Because, you know, I, I don't see you out there on, on right traffic. Right, exactly, yeah. Well, you've got something new going on down at uh, Suwanee. Do you want to tell us about what you've got yourself involved in there? <laughs> sure. As we've discussed before, Max, I've, I've got too many jobs. The, the troubles, I love them all. You know, I'm a math professor here at the university, and I have my flying smart column in AOPA pilot and I run the aerobatic school here. And as if I needed yet another job, I, I added one, but it's a labor of love. Suwanee, the University of South, uh, from what I can see, is the only liberal arts college in the country that actually has its own airport on campus. And I've been assisting the university in uh, run, creating its own flight school. And I'm pretty excited about it. I hired a career flight instructor who is fantastic. His name is Tommy Johnson. And uh, so he's our uh, flight instructor at the airport. And he, he loves what he, he does. And it, like I said, he's a career flight instructor. So he's dedicated to our students. He's dedicated to the program. And next month, we pick up our brand new Cessna 172 from the factory in Kansas. So I could not be more excited about that. And to see my airport flourish is uh, pretty exciting. Well, I see the logo on your shirt there. It says the Flying Tigers. Was that created specially for the program? Exactly. Yeah. So this, um, of course, the Flying Tigers were from uh, World War II and the Suwannee's mascot is the Tigers. So I asked the wonderful art folks at the university to create a uh, version of the Flying Tigers that is consistent with the logo they have for uh, the university, the Suwannee Tigers. So this is the, the Suwannee Flying Tigers. And to find more out about our program, uh, of which uh, you know not only the students here at the university can avail themselves of expert, just wonderful flight instruction in wonderful equipment at our airport, the web address is uh, flyingtigers at sawani.edu. So I'm, ex I'm just super excited about that. That's fantastic. And where do people find more about you and your writing? So uh, my aerobatic school uh, is, my email address is uh, Catherine at aceaerobaticschool.com or the web address is uh, aceaerobaticschool.com. And again, I write the Flying Smart column in AOPA Pilot Magazine that appears every month in the Rudder and Wrench section. So I'm always grateful for folks who write me and uh, just connect with me on my article topics, or if they have any uh, comments, I'm always happy to hear them. Well, it's always such a delight to have you here on the program. Dr. Catherine Cavagnaro, thanks so much for joining us again here today. Thanks so much, Max. And I, I got to tell you, after this uh, conversation, you know, I think you're somebody I definitely want to fly with. <laughs> That'll be fun. Let's let's figure out how to do that soon. Yeah, I'd like that sometime. So yeah, likewise. All right. Thanks again for having me. It's always a pleasure. And my thanks to Catherine Cavagnar for joining us today. Hopefully you learned a few things from her that will make you a better pilot. You'll find links to Catherine's flight school, her YouTube channel, and the University of the South Aviation program in our show notes. And if you've gotten all the way to this point, you must love the show. But if you're one of the 97% of listeners who just haven't yet gotten around to supporting the show, hey, I totally get that. Life is busy, and yes, it would take a few minutes to go online and sign up. But hey, if you're getting a free hour of useful information each week that can hopefully save a life, well, please go ahead and take a moment to sign up now. Everyone who donates gets their name read on the show, and depending upon what level you sign up at, you may receive the scripts to our new shows, links to the many news stories we had to cut for time, 
free access to my online courses, and at the $50 a month level, I'll read your name every month and send you a signed copy of one of my books after two months. If you'd like to receive all of those goodies, then you need to sign up through Patreon to make a monthly donation. To do that, go to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, and you can pay using a credit card. You can also support the show through PayPal, and their system gives you the choice of either donating monthly or making a one-time donation. Now, if you do sign up via PayPal, I don't have a way to get the show notes to you, but you can still get the free online courses and books that I offer at the $35 and $50 month levels. And to donate via PayPal, go to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. And thanks so much for your support. And finally, please tell all of your friends about the Aviation News Talk podcast. And if they don't know what a podcast is, send them out to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store on their phone where they can download our dedicated app for free. Just search in the store for Aviation News Talk. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. <laughs>